Picture this, if you will. You're working in a pediatric emergency department when you're called by the nurse to evaluate an 11-year-old female who just came in vomiting profusely, hyperventilating, and confused. Her parents say she's been losing weight despite eating more for the past few months, and more recently, can't seem to go more than an hour without running to the bathroom. About three days ago, she started complaining of burning with urination and back pain. Her mother, having had urinary tract infections before, has been giving her cranberry juice for the symptoms. But for the last 24 hours, she's been vomiting uncontrollably and has been increasingly unable to concentrate. You suspect that the patient actually has undertreated pyelonephritis instead of your garden variety urinary tract infection and wonder how an otherwise healthy young patient became so rapidly and aggressively septic until your nurse shows you that her finger stick glucose levels are higher than the glucometer can detect at greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter. Welcome to the section on hyperglycemic emergencies, a core topic in emergency, critical care, and internal medicine. These pathologies are some of the most common causes of critical illness and require meticulously careful management since the treatment can easily be as life-threatening as the disease itself. By the end of this episode, you'll be able to 1. Name the two main types of hyperglycemic emergency. 2. Describe which patient populations tend to get each type of hyperglycemic emergency, what triggers the acute event, and why. 3. List the three major metabolic consequences that characterize each type of hyperglycemic emergency and describe the signs and symptoms caused by each. 4. Compare and contrast the characteristic lab abnormalities used in the diagnosis of each type of hyperglycemic emergency. And 5. Describe the common treatment pathway for hyperglycemic emergencies and compare and contrast the treatment goals for each. There are two major types of hyperglycemic emergency, diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, otherwise known as DKA and HHS. Now, they both have a lot of overlap in their etiology, pathophysiology, and treatment, but the main distinction is that DKA is characterized by ludicrously high levels of serum ketones, and HHS is not. Unsurprisingly, the hyperglycemic emergencies generally occur in patients with diabetes mellitus, but DKA tends to occur in patients with type 1 diabetes, whereas HHS tends to occur in patients with type 2 diabetes. So, why the difference, you might ask? Why are keto acids typically produced in type 1 but not type 2 diabetes? Well, conceptually, there's a threshold insulin concentration below which a patient will become hyperglycemic, and that's where most poorly controlled diabetics live. But the threshold for the kind of robust ketogenesis that you see in DKA is a lot lower. Now, in type 1 diabetes, the insulin pretty rapidly plummets to zero by virtue of autoimmune destruction of the gland, so there's no question that the insulin levels can bottom out low enough to trigger ketogenesis unless the insulin is exogenously administered. With type 2 diabetes, the threshold insulin concentrations for hyperglycemia and ketogenesis increase simply because the cell's insulin sensitivity is impaired, and the baseline level of insulin activity in a type 2 diabetic is usually enough to prevent ketogenesis. Keep in mind, though, over the natural history of type 2 diabetes, beta cell production of insulin does usually decrease. And when it does, ketogenesis becomes a real, albeit less likely, possibility. Now, DKA and HHS often occur either in the context of physiologic stressors like infectious diseases and myocardial infarction that increase the body's stress response. In DKA especially, medication noncompliance is a very common precipitating factor, particularly amongst your younger diabetic patients. A key precipitating factor in HHS that's not characteristically an inciting factor of DKA is dehydration. And to understand why, it's necessary to dive into the pathophysiology. Let's start with diabetic ketoacidosis, the more physiologically complex of the two major hyperglycemic emergencies. DKA is a syndrome that essentially stems from three major issues. First, these patients are almost by definition hyperglycemic, which leads to dehydration. So, how come they're so dehydrated? The reason they're so dehydrated is the same reason that normal diabetic patients have polyuria, because increased blood glucose also leads to increased glucose in the urine, and subsequently, increased water loss via osmosis. Second, the absence of usable glucose substrate causes another important physiologic consequence. The generation of ketone bodies. When there's no glucose and the cell's hungry, fatty acid metabolism takes over. 
And this seems like a pretty good idea, since fatty acid metabolism generates humongous amounts of acetyl-CoA to be used in oxidative metabolism. But when the sheer volume of acetyl-CoA overwhelms the Krebs cycle, they pile up in the cell and, instead of being used for energy immediately, link carbons together to form products like acetone and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And these are collectively known as the ketone bodies and get jettisoned into the bloodstream if the cell can't make use of them immediately. For the cells that can't access glucose in the bloodstream and don't have the kind of immediate access to fatty acids that the liver does, the ketone bodies act as an essential source of energy that can be scavenged from the bloodstream and catabolized. The problem is, ketone bodies are acidic, and when enough of them pile up in the bloodstream, you get an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Finally, one of the other major problems patients present with is potassium abnormalities. And this one's not quite so intuitive. First, where is potassium primarily located within the body? Potassium is primarily an intracellular ion. And the constant influx of potassium ions is normally supported by none other than insulin. Without sufficient insulin, potassium ions move into the extracellular compartment. But here's the interesting thing. Because glucose acts as a diuretic and makes you excrete ungodly amounts of urine, you also lose a ton of electrolytes, including potassium. Now, the kidney is usually smart enough to try to retain its electrolytes when it senses that blood levels aren't where they're supposed to be. But as a result of the dehydration, aldosterone is going to be operating at extremely high levels. So what do you think that's going to do to the potassium? It's going to cause loss of total body potassium into the urine, which leads to a very interesting potassium situation. While the patient can present with hyperkalemia from their insulin deficiency and dehydration, the fact is their total body potassium is always depleted. We'll talk about why that's important, but trust me, it's majorly important. Now, the signs, symptoms, and complications of DKA are all related to these three pathophysiologic components of the disease. The dehydration means that these patients generally come in tachycardic, with extreme cases presenting with hypovolemic shock. The acidosis, however, is what leads to some of the most characteristic symptoms. First, how does the body compensate for metabolic acidosis? Through hyperventilation. In the case of DKA, through very rapid and deep breaths called Kussmaul respirations. Also characteristic of DKA is severe nonspecific epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting, and the smell of acetone on the breath. The vignettes may describe this as fruity or like pear drops, but to me, acetone smells like nail polish remover. One pretty unique complication of DKA is mucormycosis. Remember that one from Micro? It's a face-eating fungus whose favorite food just happens to be ketones and sugar, and whose favorite environment just happens to be slightly acidic. And this is a big deal, not just because you need your face to stay beautiful, but also because it spreads surprisingly fast and is more than capable of penetrating into the brain. Be thinking of acute invasive fungal sinusitis if your patient with DKA develops facial symptoms like orbital swelling or any of the cranial neuropathies. They talk more about this in the micro section, but just remember, this is an emergency and requires surgical debridement. The entire cocktail of metabolic abnormalities will usually have the patient presenting with CNS complications, like delirium, psychosis, and even coma, and with cardiac arrhythmias that can lead to heart failure. So to summarize, DKA involves a trifecta of dehydration, acidosis, and potassium disruption. But most of the early symptoms of DKA are caused by the acidosis. Both blood sugar and acid levels rise gradually, until the acidosis causes significant symptoms. Then they come in, get treated, and move on with their lives. With HHS, the degree of ketogenesis is minimal, so you don't get any of the symptoms associated with metabolic acidosis. Most of the problems are specifically related to the patient's blood sugars, which can rise to insane levels before they start to feel sick. So while these conditions are related, the focus of the problem is quite different. Potassium abnormalities are similar to those of DKA, but because the blood sugar is so much higher, the dehydration is typically much worse. But the bigger issue is that, with a glucose over 600, and commonly in the thousands, the serum osmolarity gets tremendously high. And as you learn in the section on syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, bad things happen when your osmolarity gets out of whack. The symptoms are mostly neurological, progressing from lethargy all the way to seizures and coma. You should be able to distinguish DKA from HHS from the labs because they're pretty distinctive. You can remember these lab values pretty easily if you know the three main metabolic abnormalities of each. 
Both DKA and HHS cause dehydration and potassium abnormalities. But while DKA is characterized by metabolic acidosis, HHS is characterized by hyperosmolarity. If you remember these, it's pretty easy to remember the labs for each. First, what's the cause of the dehydration? Hyperglycemia, which can be measured in both the serum and in the urine. In DKA, the glucose is usually over 250 mg per deciliter. But in HHS, the hyperglycemia and therefore dehydration are much more severe, with glucose levels almost always higher than 600. Second, like we mentioned, the total body potassium is usually depleted, but since patients generally lose more water than potassium, you usually see either normal potassium or hyperkalemia in your patient when they first present. It's not super predictable, but it's very important to look for because it can seriously increase your risk of cardiac arrhythmias, and it affects your treatment, as you'll see in a moment. Now starting with DKA, what lab values would you expect for metabolic acidosis? Like with any metabolic acidosis, pH will be low, and bicarbonate will also be low. And yes, you may see respiratory compensation with a low PCO2. I mean, that's the purpose of the Kussmaul breathing. The problem is, when they get too encephalopathic from DKA, or have respiratory decompensation as well, you can't count on that as a diagnostic feature. But the most specific diagnostic feature of DKA is the presence of ketone bodies in the serum and in the urine. When you order the labs, it'll usually be beta-hydroxybutyrate, or BHB. But if your suspicion for DKA isn't high enough initially to order the serum ketone assay, then, like any organic acidosis, you'll see an elevated anion gap in the basic chemistry panel. Not enough time to go into that one, but check out the section on acidosis and alkalosis for more information. Now, HHS is a lot easier. Because it's defined by hyperosmolarity, you just have to measure the serum osmoles, and the diagnostic cutoff is a serum osmolarity of greater than 320 milliosmoles. Now, when it comes to treatment, what is the most important thing to give to a patient with either DKA or HHS? All of you people who said insulin are wrong. But don't feel bad, because almost everyone got this wrong in my third year as well. By far the most important thing to give is fluids. Believe it or not, the hypovolemia and hyperosmolarity from all that glucose are generally more lethal in these patients than the acidosis. Aggressive hydration will not only fix these issues quickly, but also provide sufficient fluid for the kidneys to start correcting the problems on their own. Of course, you're also going to want to start the patient on insulin eventually to fix the underlying issues of hyperglycemia and ketoacidosis. Now here's the thing, when treating hyperglycemic emergencies, you've got to remember that you can actually cause major problems with the treatment itself. Decreasing the blood glucose too quickly can cause life-threatening hypoglycemia, and decreasing the osmolarity too quickly can lead to cerebral edema, especially in children. So you can't give subcutaneous insulin. It has to be in the form of an IV insulin infusion, or DRIP, so you can monitor mental status, labs, and glucose every one to two hours and adjust the insulin infusion moment to moment. And on the note of labs to check regularly, remember how I was telling you that the, while the serum potassium was concentrated, the total body potassium was actually low? Well, once the insulin and fluids are on board, the cells are gonna be like, thanks, but now I want my potassium back. Unfortunately, a lot of it's now in your pee, and unless you feel like drinking that, you're never getting it back. What happens then is that potassium moves back into the cells and can completely deplete the serum potassium if you're not watching that lab value like a hawk. So if the potassium drops too low, stop the insulin and be ready to replace their potassium whenever necessary. So for either DKA or HHS, how do you know when to stop pounding them with IV insulin? Again, this one's not intuitive because you're not waiting for the serum glucose to correct itself. No, the endpoint that most effectively tells you that you're out of the danger zone is when you fix the metabolic issue that's causing most of the problems. Ketoacidosis in DKA, estimated by normalization of the anion gap, and hyperosmolarity in HHS. Now, I gotta address this issue. There's a widely circulated fact out there that hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state is far deadlier than DKA, and it is the case that the mortality rate of patients coming in with HHS is a whopping 10 to 20% compared to 2 to 3% in DKA. And sure, 
Some of it might be the inherent neurologic danger of allowing your osmolarity to get so high it gives your brain the shrinks, but consider your populations. Now, if you had to form a mental image of your classic DKA patient and your classic HHS patient, what do they look like? I'll show you what mine look like. Exhibit A is a shitty teenager called Pimples, because I can't remember what his name is, and because he annoys me. And he's telling me for the third time this year he's puking his guts out because he couldn't be bothered to take his insulin because of puberty or whatever his excuse was. Exhibit B, on the other hand, is an old man named Eugene from the nursing home with severe dementia who was sent to the ER for quote-unquote lethargy. No further explanation, no family or staff at bedside, and the patient of course can't give a history or a reliable exam, but hey, the nursing home helpfully sent a medication list about 15 pages long and a complete record of all 36 surgeries he had in the past year. So thanks for that. You get where I'm going with this, right? Simply by virtue of the fact that DKA patients tend to be younger and otherwise healthy, their physiology is a lot more resilient and can take a beating. That's why pimples can stay out partying all night and get up early for baseball practice. What's more, whenever Eugene comes in with HHS, you have to wonder, what put him in HHS in the first place? So, for Eugene's sake, when you're done acutely managing the HHS, evaluate and treat the underlying cause of what brought him in in the first place because old people don't do too well with physiologic insults. And that wraps it up for hyperglycemic emergencies. Let's test your knowledge of this very important topic with a flash quiz. Your question is, what are the three most common precipitating factors leading to diabetic ketoacidosis in patients currently being treated for diabetes? Pause if you need some time to think. And the answer is, physiologic stressors like infection, myocardial infarction, as well as medication noncompliance. And this leads to the mnemonic you might often hear, infection, infarction, and insulin omission. There's a lot to know about hyperglycemic emergencies, but here's the bottom line. The two categories of hyperglycemic emergency are diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, or HHS, that differ primarily by the following. DKA and ketogenesis typically occur at much lower insulin levels relative to when the hyperglycemia begins. Metabolic acidosis secondary to ketone production causes most of the acute symptoms of DKA. And finally, HHS involves minimal ketogenesis, but the dehydration is typically much more severe and the glucose and serum osmolarity are much higher. Treatment for both prioritizes IV fluid administration, then, IV insulin infusion, and potassium replacement as needed. If you like the video, go ahead and give the thumbs up button down below. And as always, comments are more than welcome. Happy studying, friends!